Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again! We're looking at the Spider-Man storyline, Maximum Carnage! Well, that's another one of the top 15 comics I'll never review crossed off the list! You remember that, right? My 99th episode? Last one I did at my very first filming location? Ooh, what are you people gonna make me do next, huh? huh? Marvel vs. DC? Mm, possibility. I am gonna do an Amalgam Comics month at some point. Uh, Punisher meets Archie is a possibility. Marvel Zombies? Eh, Moartes did that one twice now, so maybe I should cross that off. Did an entire month dedicated to Marvel Zombies comics. It's Longbox's 10th anniversary, you know. Ooh, my money is on Batman number 66, a.k.a. the one where the Joker says boner a whole lot. Lost Girls? Still never gonna happen. It's porn. Probably gonna be the last holdout. This episode is gonna be a really long one, so let's just do the theme song now. Maximum Carnage is a polarizing story. Some decry its goofy resolution, others appreciate what the story was trying to say, but I think everyone can agree on one thing, it's way too damn long! Fourteen parts, my friends. This is longer than Crisis on Infinite Earths and Secret Wars, for crying out loud. Longer than most event comics. I think Secret Empire is technically longer, but only because the individual issues are longer than standard comic issues. But the point is that Maximum Carnage is really frickin' long, and under normal circumstances I wouldn't be covering it because I do have length limits for review requests. However, like the Batman Hush review, I'm letting them get away with it because it's a story I'm already very familiar with. I've read it multiple times over the years, and I really enjoy it, which is one of the reasons it was originally on the 15 comics I'll never review list, because back then I refused to do good comics. I didn't think I could make them funny. Then people figured out I wasn't funny when talking about bad comics either, so it became kind of moot. Still, 14 parts, no. This is way longer than it needs to be. Anyway, my first exposure to Maximum Carnage wasn't actually with the book, but the video game of it. And now a lot of you are going, oh right, the Super NES game. You are wrong. 90s dude? Dude, Genesis does what Nintendo don't! The Genesis version of Maximum Carnage totally rocks! Yeah, remember people, I was a Genesis kid, and when you're a kid who's a fan of Spider-Man and you see this thing on the rental shelves at Blockbuster, oh hell yeah, I'm gonna get it! And I hate to say it, but I like the Genesis version better. Fundamentally, the two versions are the same, but for me it's all about the music. Some will swear by the Super Nintendo's version, better instrument variation, more reverb, but for me, a game and a story like this need a grungier, slightly more grindy edge to it, and the Genesis music does that for me. The boss fight music is probably the most noticeably different, and I think the Genesis one is better, sounding more frightening and with an actual tune, versus the SNES having more of a drone and a drum emphasis. Plus, the main theme on the SNES version feels like it's going at a slightly slower tempo than the Genesis one, so it doesn't sound right to me. The songs, written by the rock band Green Jelly, are amazing in either version, both having the same notes, just put together and sounding different because, of course, two different game consoles. And then there was the brilliant usage of panels from the Maximum Carnage comic in the game as cutscenes to transition between levels. Some limited motion in there, too. It's great stuff and overall worked for me to get the story across. Also, gotta love that bit-crunched carnage laugh. 
Beautiful. But yeah, enough of me wax and nostalgia. What the hell's the deal with this book? The original idea for the book came from editor Danny Fingeroth. I don't know what the original idea was exactly, but J.M. Dematius in the introduction for the trade collection said that there was an original idea, but that it morphed into what we have today. Dematius wasn't very excited to work on it, doing four of the issues, because he wasn't really fond of Venom and Carnage, nor of villains in general who are one-note psychopaths. And of course, he, like most people by the time the mid-90s rolled around, was rather sick of superheroes being teeth-gritting, gun-toting murderers in the books as well. He wanted more traditional, kind, decent and compassionate superheroics in his books. And Fingeroth said that that's exactly the point of Maximum Carnage, that this multi-part story spread throughout the Spider-Man books would very much declare that more extreme methods of vigilantism were wrong and that they would not be utilized to stop villains, even ones as horrific as Carnage and his teammates in this book. Still probably didn't need over 300 pages of comic to say that, but what you gonna do? And so he and the other creatives locked themselves away in a hotel for two days, hammering out the details of the story, and they felt pretty damn good about it by the end. Was it actually as good as they thought it was? So let's dig into Spider-Man, Maximum Carnage, and see for ourselves. Reading from a trade, so no looking at the covers, but let's face it, 14 comics in this episode is going to be long enough as is. On the off chance you're not familiar with the titular Carnage, he was created to be a more villainous version of Venom, since Venom himself had proven to be immensely popular with fans, and he had his whole anti-hero thing going for him. Carnage is Cletus Cassidy, a serial killer who shared a prison cell with Eddie Brock before the Venom symbiote freed him. The symbiote was in the process of reproducing at the time, leaving its spawn behind in the cell, and said spawn Spawn, another symbiote, merged with Cletus to create Carnage. Spidey and Venom teamed up and destroyed the Carnage symbiote with a sonic blaster. So naturally, this story, called Maximum Carnage, will not feature the Carnage symbiote whatsoever, since it was destroyed and all. We open in Ravencroft, the fictional maximum security prison in the Marvel Universe, where Cletus is being escorted down a hall by five guards. Here comes the bride, all dressed in white. I wish it was red, then you'd all be dead. Cletus was a big Game of Thrones fan. Real funny, Cassidy. You're a regular Weird Al Yankovic, with an emphasis on the weird. Yeah, though I don't know how I feel about his version of Harvey the Wonder Hamster. Thank you, Officer Resnick. I sincerely hope that I can someday return the courtesy you've shown me by slaughtering you quickly and with minimal agony. Though first on the list is the guy who gave me this haircut. Cassidy is being brought to some doctors to be examined to see if his particular homicidal tendencies are a result of a chemical imbalance. They say he's got a clean bill of health save for a weird blood anomaly, which Cassidy says is because there's a monster inside him. There are monsters within all of us, Mr. Cassidy. Mine's a Wendigo. But it's at this point that the Carnage symbiote comes out to play and forms over him. You should have listened, Doc! I warned you! There really is a monster hiding within me! His name is Carl, and he's a mummy! You test tube jockeys are all the same! Can't accept the truth when it's spinning in your eye! The monster is far more than a wild pair of long johns! Wait, was her theory that his underwear was too tight? Hey, Resnick! Remember how I said I'd go easy on you? I lied! Dishonesty, Cletus. Well, now I'm just more disappointed than angry. You should have known better than to trust a raving lunatic! I am the ultimate insanity! I am Carnage! Oh yeah? Try being as insane as Marvel, and then we'll talk about you being the ultimate in it, Cletus. Carnage quickly slaughters everyone save for the doctor, who begs him to let her help him. But Carnage just laughs off her efforts to help him and promises to kill everyone in the place. We cut over to a funeral, but not for anyone in Ravencroft. Family. Sometimes having a family can be pure aggravation. Dominic Toretto is giving you the stink eye, narrator. The funeral's for Harry Osborn, who had just died in Spectacular Spider-Man number 200. It's a really good issue and an epic conclusion to their conflict, if a tragic one. Unfortunately, he also died while being exposed to the Green Goblin and having tried to kill Spider-Man and acting like a weirdo to a bunch of people, so the funeral's kind of sparse for attendance. It's a fact noted by J. Jonah Jameson. If you ask me that Web Swingin' Menace is responsible for this tragedy, and I intend to prove it! Singing a different tune there, Jonah, considering the Green Goblin Goblin showed up in your office to terrify you in that issue. Aunt May and Peter's parents decide to head out at this point. We didn't know your friend, but if there's anything we can do... Just you and Mom being here was more than enough, Dad. Thank God you two aren't evil robot duplicates as part of a scheme that Harry had set in motion before he died. That'd suck. 
Peter pays his condolences to Harry's wife Liz, who asks him to not move out of their building out of respect for Harry, since Harry had said the time they were together was the best of his life. Peter says he'll talk to them about it later. Harry was my best friend and my greatest enemy. Why wasn't I carrying a hostess fruit pie to prevent this? Friends, foes, and family. How did they ever manage to get so confused and jumbled together? Just you wait, people. At some point, Aunt May is gonna be revealed as some nefarious supervillain planning his downfall. That's how Peter's life works at this point. Meanwhile, Carnage has been slaughtering his way through all the guards at Ravencroft, rambling about how he plans to go after Spider-Man and Venom, until he hears a voice calling out to cheer him on. And soon he finds the villainess Shriek. Believe it or not, this is actually her first appearance ever, despite being a major player in the storyline and for Carnage overall. She's a mutant who has the ability to manipulate sound, and another power we'll learn about later. Otherwise, she also has the power to walk around on her tippy toes for no reason. In any case, she wants to join Carnage in his... Carnage. Ooh, those tentacles are simply wild. This could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Said Ripley to the android bishop. Arriving back home, Peter and MJ start talking, with MJ even lighting up a cigarette. Mary Jane, I know this isn't the best timing, but you're smoking. Think what it's doing to your health. We just attended one memorial service. Please don't make me attend yours. That's right, people. This episode has actually been a stealth PSA hell review this whole time. Smoking is like a serial killer with an alien costume going on a killing spree. In your lungs. Don't confuse the issues, Peter. Harry might still be alive if he had taken up smoking instead of being the Green Goblin. There is logic in what he says. Meanwhile, Peter's thinking about that time he teamed up with Storm and Luke Cage to fight a smoking-themed villain. Anyway, while MJ would never ask Peter to permanently stop being Spidey, she thinks that maybe for the sake of his own health, he should take a week or two off from web swinging, which he agrees to. Speaking of swinging, Carnage is doing just that, as he and Shriek recount their origins to each other. In Shriek's case, being a bit more vague other than committing mass murder before running into a weird dude who, quite literally, not figuratively, blew her mind. I mean, it did seem to convince her she was a member of KISS. Then again, KISS is canon to the Marvel Universe, and their KISS forms are from magic, so maybe that is true. Carnage figures that the symbiote somehow mutated his metabolism during the previous fight with Venom and Spider-Man, and that's how he's able to recreate it. In the meantime, he spots what he thinks is Spider-Man going into an alleyway and heads over to attack him, but it's revealed to be Doppelganger, that evil duplicate of Spider-Man we saw way back in the Infinity War review. You know, while I was locked in the vault, I heard some goofy rumors about a pack of evil duplicates from outer space and... Nah, it's all too hokey for words. Hmm. File that one away for later. But yeah, somehow Doppelganger survived getting impaled and Carnage figures he can kill him anyway, but Shriek actually likes the monstrous creature, blasting Carnage back with a sonic attack so she can keep Doppelganger as a pet. And Doppelganger seems all too happy about this. Peter heads out to pick up some Chinese takeout, but overhears the radio talking about the massacre at Ravencroft, figuring it must have been Carnage and leaping into action, though lamenting that it seems like his villains are always returning, no matter how many times he beats them. He's got a point, even the villains who die end up coming back. Multiple times in some cases. Even Doppelganger has died and come back a few times. Spidey runs into Shriek and Doppelganger on a rooftop, and it's a brutal battle. Some good back and forth, but the end result is that Spidey learns that the two are working with Carnage. And he gets his ribs broken by Doppelganger after he knocks Shriek unconscious. Doppelganger takes her away as Spidey collapses in an alleyway. At the Daily Bugle, Jonah hears about how Carnage has escaped and decides to make a quick exit from New York City for the time being. So quick that it turns him into a black guy for this panel. I'm guessing that's a coloring error because Robbie Robertson is right there in the previous panel. In a re-release of the trade, they made it slightly better, but yeah, still pretty dark. Anyway, point is that the first part of this epic ends with Carnage waiting on Jameson's desk, informing him that he's gonna help bring Venom out here. We move into part two with a bunch of punks standing over Spidey and getting ready to kill him for seemingly no reason. This is a miracle! And I want you to fucking acknowledge it. 
Fortunately, he's saved by Cloak and Dagger, heroes who tend to get lots of guest appearances, but have had trouble holding their own series. They tend to be used as supporting characters or part of a team, but hey, what really works is that they premiered in Spider-Man stuff, so they get to be bigger players in this story. Oh yeah, and Dagger has one of the most impressive boob holes in all of comics. I don't even know if you can call it a hole when it's just this massive plunging dagger shape on her front, all the way to her navel. Ha 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 ha! Your costume is ridiculous! Ridiculous. But anyway, yeah, the punks are driven off and they take Spider-Man to safety. Over to Shriek and Doppelganger. No matter what you hear about the rest of the world, the concept of family in the 90s has taken on a much broader meaning in New York City. Well, good. Family can be lots of things. Found family with friends, polycules, more traditional families, and evil spider doppelgangers made for event comics alongside serial killers who either use alien costumes or sonic blasts. New York is a big city. There's room for all of it, dang it. They're on their way to rendezvous with Carnage, who has finished up his meeting with Jameson. This is a major scoop, Robbie, and our readers have every right to know that Carnage is looking for Spider-Man and Venom. The only question is, how can we turn this into a listicle? Ooh, and have it behind a paywall. It's nothing more than terrorist blackmail, Jonah. That maniac nearly tore you to shreds. Damn it, Robbie, he threatened to rip up my other shirts too. Do you see this? This is Armani. Cloak and Dagger have reset and bandaged Spidey's ribs, but as they point out, he kind of needs proper medical attention. Or at least he's going to need some when he gets back and MJ notices he didn't bring the food. Doppelganger decided to go back for revenge against Spidey for harming Shriek, so he leads her right to where the three heroes are located, inside of a church. As a fight breaks out, we learn that Cloak had actually been the one to confront Shriek before she became who she is, having once passed through the dark abyss inside of his outfit. I was merely a downtown drug dealer trying to make dead ends meet Cloak, when your endless black abyss first introduced me to the singular satisfaction of madness years ago! Is this the human condition of madness? It is. Carnage arrives and the tide of battle turns on our heroes, not helped by Spidey's injured ribs. In the battle, Dagger and Shriek have what could be considered a beam struggle between their respective light and sound powers. And Dagger loses, getting blasted and seemingly disintegrated by it. Though it seems Carnage isn't too happy about any of this, since he's mad that Shriek went to try to kill Spider-Man without him, even slapping her. You know, people, I'm starting to suspect that this relationship isn't healthy. Carnage and his cronies retreat, a dark figure watching them and deciding to follow. Cloak suspects that Dagger absorbed the brunt of an explosion from Shriek's powers. He takes it well. Daddy! Oh yeah, I wake up screaming that sometimes when I remember that the Wiz kids exist. The issue ends in San Francisco, where Venom is beating up some muggers. However, he overhears a TV talking about Carnage being back, and thus decides he needs to head to New York. And indeed, part three begins with Eddie Brock's arrival at LaGuardia Airport. Seeing a newspaper featuring a shot of Carnage makes him so pissed off, he transforms into Venom in the middle of the terminal. Venom? <laughs> Could freeze possibly be the word you're looking for? Well... Yeah, sorry, you're gonna need to put your symbiote in the checked luggage. Venom quickly hops out of the airport and makes his way to the city, monologuing to himself about how he didn't want to come back to New York after settling his vendetta with Spidey, but he needs to stop Carnage. Cloak, meanwhile, swears he'll have vengeance for Dagger and teleports away. Peter swings off to go back to MJ while Carnage berates Shriek for taking his kill on a rooftop. Jeez, Carney, I, I just thought... THOUGHT?! You thought, sweet cheeks, that's a vile little habit that I think you'd better break! Here, read X-Men Green, that'll cure you of it. Peter returns to his apartment where MJ is a bit peeved at him for breaking the no Spider-Man for two weeks thing. Personally, I'd be more mad he didn't bring back dinner since there's a difference between going on regular patrols as Spidey versus there's a disaster currently happening and I need to go deal with it, but whatever. At the very least, MJ wants him to get some rest to heal his ribs. It's nice that the radioactive spider that bit him imparted a spider's natural affinity for bone mending. But Peter says he needs to head back out to try to find Carnage and his crew before they kill anyone else. There's some nice back and forth here between Carnage's team versus MJ and Peter. Shriek is actually on board with what Carnage is saying, and they're making up and being happy together in their evil, whereas Peter and MJ's relationship is strained by their two equally valid viewpoints of the situation. We're in the first act of the story, and it kind of sets up a recurring motif. 
The villains are that much more dangerous because they're mostly unified and want to accomplish the same horrible thing. The good guys, however, are fractured and unable to come to an agreement on how best to approach the problem. Anyway, Carnage's crew murder some people in a park. Yeah, that's definitely one of the issues with the book that I can't really argue against. There is a sizable civilian casualty list in this story, and they're usually very violent deaths at that. They at least had the class to not show blood and viscera and other unpleasant visuals like some comics would in the future, but even the implications are pretty yikes. I get that it's to show how dangerous they are and to make it that much more satisfying when the heroes win through, but still. Anyway, Spidey is back on the web line and spots the figure who had been watching Carnage's crew earlier. A villain I don't think I've ever talked about before. Demo Goblin. Demo Goblin's backstory is complicated, but more or less he's a demonic being who actually hates sinners and sees himself as a good guy. Problem is, his definition of sinners is pretty broad, with really only children being the exception. I really love his design, though I guess they were still on a venom high when they made him, because he's got the sharp teeth and tongue thing he does. Anyway, Demo Goblin had teamed up with Doppelganger in a previous storyline, so Spidey figures following him might lead to carnage and the rest. Unfortunately, Demo Goblin spots him and tosses a black pumpkin bomb at him, which lets out some kind of living darkness that envelops our hero. What was that black goo? Feel so cold. What's happening to me? Oh, yeah, Peter, I've been there. I had to review Man of Steel recently. It'll pass. That was no ordinary bomb, Spider-Man. It was my bath bomb. It was meant to give you a taste of what all sinners must eventually face. The despair and unending hopelessness of eternal torment. It's like I was watching the entirety of the Big Bang Theory at once. Even young Sheldon. A priest tries to intervene for Spidey's sake, and yeah, as I said, Demo Goblin's definition of sinner is pretty broad, so he's more than happy to attack the guy. The priests attempt to help shake Spidey out of his funk. Have to fight against the darkness. Fight it with truth. The truth? That no matter how I feel, as long as I breathe, there is hope. And he socks Demo Goblin. The hope of punching things! Demo Goblin sends out a regular pumpkin bomb and forces Spidey to get the priest away. It hurts his ribs further, but fortunately the demon flies off. Spidey realizes that he's just in no shape to carry on and heads back to the apartment. Venom, meanwhile, is caught up with Carnage at Central Park. All is silent. The screams have stopped. Ah, so Mr. Computer finally fled the area. Venom is quickly attacked by all three members of Carnage's crew. We cut back to the apartment, where Peter and MJ are watching the news and learn of the massacre at Central Park. There's a knock at the door, and we end part three with the reveal of Venom severely injured from his fight with the villains. Nice of him to knock, at least. Carnage, Doppelganger, and Shriek make their way to a prop warehouse that stored stuff for heavy metal concerts. Something that Shriek knew of from her days as a groupie, so they can have a place to rest up. I've always buzzed on heavy metal! It's all about chaos! And chaos is the future! Laws are only words! You can do anything you want! Anything! As long as you've got the guts to make it happen! That's a little lesson we're gonna teach the world together! This is a weird reboot of the Partridge Family. I guess in the time in between comics, Mary Jane decided to put on some clothes, since we ended it with her in a robe and her underwear, whereas now she's in a dress. Great continuity! MJ wants Peter to throw Eddie out, but Peter can tell he's in bad shape and wants to help him. She leaves, naturally pissed about everything that's happened. Peter helps Eddie to the couch, saying he didn't want to go to him for help, but he obviously needs it to fight against Carnage. He elects to rest for the time being... And Peter decides, screw resting as well. He wants to take Venom in too, but recognizes he may be just what's needed to stop Carnage. He needs to go to someone for advice, and with MJ gone, he elects to see Felicia Hardy, aka the Black Cat. Felicia had been at Harry's funeral, so she was probably on his mind. After he explains the situation to her, she decides that they do indeed have to help Venom stop Carnage. A bit surprising, since the last time the two met, Venom had beaten her near to death while looking for Spider-Man. MJ, meanwhile, has gone to visit Aunt May and Peter's parents. May remarks that she had been meaning to call back and ask about how Liz Osborne is doing. The funeral was yesterday. Hell, it might still be the same day! Yes, it must be awful losing a husband like that. He was so young, so loved. Which reminds me, how's Peter? Is he dead, old, and unloved yet? Demo Goblin arrives at the warehouse, having had some kind of psychic link with Doppelganger that allowed him to track them there. He attacks the group, immune to Shriek's sonic attacks, his fire repels Carnage, and Doppelganger has split loyalties, 
But when he mentions he wants to punish sinners and kill them, Carnage instead extends an invitation to join them. The contrasting of our heroes and villains continue as Peter argues with Felicia while she suits up. And man, 90s superheroine outfits sure loved plunging necklines, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, Black Cat's outfit has always been a bit boobalicious, but not usually down past her belly button. But anyway, point is that Peter says that working with Venom means condoning his ruthless methods, but Black Cat says that sometimes you have to do distasteful things to protect the innocent. Again, the heroes are fractured, divided by different ideologies over what's moral and right, while the villains are coming together under the shared goal of killing people. And indeed, Demo Goblin, with his twisted vision, sees nothing wrong with working with the mass murderers if it'll accomplish his goal. Back at Peter's place, Eddie Brock has recovered. Good! Our strength has returned! Yes, I can help you move a couch! Black Cat and Spidey meet with him, Peter making it very clear that he's in this to save lives. If anyone on either side tries to kill someone, he'll do whatever it takes to stop them. Cloak arrives at the warehouse before the Carnage crew can leave, thinking he can take them all on his own. He cannot, of course, but fortunately the fight does attract the attention of our heroes, who join in on the scuffle. This is another criticism of the book, and one I can understand, but not entirely agree with. The book is filled to the brim with fight scenes that don't really seem to accomplish a lot. They encounter Carnage or his cronies, and they just get away, padding out the story length even further. And it can be exhausting to do the same dance over and over. That being said, I'd argue that the fights do have some thematic points to make, even if there are a lot of them. In this case, Shriek and Demo Goblin set the warehouse on fire and collapse it. The villains flee with the heroes after them, but Venom is weakened from the flames and tells Spidey to go after Carnage, but then Spidey realizes that Black Cat was left in the warehouse, and he has to choose between helping her or trying to continue the chase. Ultimately, he elects to help Black Cat, but this is another example of discontinuity between the creative teams, sadly, as we move into Part 5. In Part 4, Black Cat is buried under rubble and seemingly unconscious, Venom clear of the warehouse and still trying to pursue. Beginning of Part 5, Venom's symbiote is melting, and Black Cat is clearly still conscious and just a little buried. Venom is pissed about Spidey going back Back for her when as far as he's concerned their only priority is stopping carnage but spidey refuses to not help someone in need black cat points out venom's hypocrisy of saying spidey is wasting time while he tries to start a fight with him over this however she then berates spidey for thinking she needed help which yeah in the last issue she most certainly did venom was right my life doesn't mean a thing when you weigh it against the slaughter that could be going on out there right now. It's been like three minutes. If he felt the need to run away, he's not stopping every two seconds to stab people while he goes. Tell him again how we were right. That's our favorite part. You may have been right about that, dude, but you're certainly wrong about whatever the hell you're doing with your face here. Spider-Man refuses to come along, saying he can't be playing by Venom's more bloodthirsty rules. So Black Cat follows Venom, and Spidey nurses his broken ribs. Look, Peter, seriously, take a goddamn nap or something. At the rate you're going, your ribs are gonna be jello by the time we reach the next part. The villains soar through the skies for a bit, and Demo Goblin gets pissed that they aren't making a plan of action, and that pisses Carnage off. See, his entire deal is complete and utter chaos and anarchy. And no, since I got in trouble with this from people a few years ago, I don't mean anarchy in the political definition. Anarchy also refers to a state of disorder due to the lack of authority. And authority in this case includes a plan, something that he has to follow or be motivated by for the kind of action he should be taking. Carnage's philosophy is freedom to do whatever the hell they want. He is guided by whims. He practices extreme nihilism. Life is meaningless, there is no point, so just do whatever. And the ultimate expression of that for him is via murder, to take someone else's life. Sure, he said before he wants revenge on Spider-Man and Venom, but you notice how he isn't trying to turn around to finish them off? Try to set a trap for them, or do whatever he can to kill them, damn all the rest? No, of course not, since Carnage is driven by a single maxim. Because I feel like it and he doesn't feel like going after them right now. The only purpose is no purpose! The only plan is no plan! Carnage is an undefeated champion at Calvin Ball, as it happens. Demo Goblin rejects this because he thinks the universe is nothing but plan and pattern, but before the two can start slaughtering each other, Shriek blasts the two apart and points out that right now they've all got each other. A twisted little family that can indulge in all the things they love. Murder and mayhem. She says Carnage can view the two as his kids that he can mold and influence to match his personal philosophy. 
On the subject of family, Peter has made his way to Aunt May's house. He, of course, tries to hide his broken ribs from her and instead talks about the emotions he's dealing with. That she and Uncle Ben always steered him in the direction of what's right and decent, but that everything has gotten so much more complicated in recent years, and he can't tell what's right and what isn't anymore. May encourages him to follow his heart, and he walks off feeling a little better, but his father stops him to give him his own advice, having overheard them. Before the reveal of the parents being fake, their backstory was that they were held in a Soviet prison for 20 years, and that shaped his view on life. Strip away the veneer of civilization, and you'll find a devil inside all men. Mostly Hitler, though. Did you know that Hitler was literally the devil? Blue Beetle taught me that. He says that evil inside people is closer to the surface than anyone is willing to admit. That prison was overrun with devils, Peter. Sadistic, evil men who do anything, no matter how twisted, how immoral, to break a man down, destroy his soul. Jeez, you cancel one Taco Tuesday in the prison because of health concerns, and suddenly it's pure evil. However well-intentioned Ben and May were, they were wrong to fill your head with fairy tales about the goodness and decency of the human heart. Oh sure, there are good men in the world, your uncle was one of them, and look where it got him! Dead! Shot down like a dog! I'm beginning to see why Peter never goes to you for advice, man! And knowing my brother, he was probably looking up at the scum who did it, trying to understand why, and then he would be like, Oh right, I never did pay you back that 20 bucks. He says that it's a bleak world out there, and the only way to fight off the devils in it is to fight fire with fire. Be as bad as them if you want to survive. I wouldn't be sitting here today if I lived life the way Ben and May did, looking for the good in everyone. If I'd done that, Peter, I would have gone down in flames. Eh, I don't know, man. According to Trouble, you cheated on your wife with May, so you were already kind of a dick before the prison. He says he doesn't want his son to be broken like he was broken, and Peter just quietly leaves, letting Richard sit there as May observes these events. Although hilariously, because I know he's actually a robot, it looks more like his batteries ran out. But yeah, throughout that rant, we saw Carnage's crew cause devastation and death in their way. Venom and Black Cat are too late to stop them, and they claim this was all done in a mere few minutes of their absence. Cloak rejoins them, having needed time to recover from their last fight but points out they need reinforcements to help stop the villains. Carnage's crew slaughters everyone in a restaurant, Shriek and Carnage continuing their ha ha ha, we're a demented family routine, and mentioning maybe having more kids, as we see a figure in tatters emerge from a sewer and begin following them. I don't know how I feel about this new iteration of Ninja Turtles' Rat King. Actually, this is Carrion, a character with a bit of a complicated history, and shocking no one, that complication involves the Clone Saga. In this case, the original one from the 70s, where Carrion was supposed to be a failed, decaying clone of Miles Warren, aka the Jackal. However, since this was before the 90s Clone Saga, during this time, it had since been retconned that Warren hadn't made clones at all, but genetically altered people. Thus, this is the second Carrion, a guy named Malcolm McBride, who had been mutated by a weird virus or something Warren had made. You know, the more I read that, the more I realized that comics would be a lot easier to get people into if they didn't keep changing their minds and retconning stuff. Sure, it'd be long and full of lore, but if they didn't keep deciding, nah, I don't like this perfectly decent story, let me make a long, elaborate story in turn explaining why it didn't happen like you think it did, then it wouldn't be as difficult to follow. Admittedly, that would mean bad stories that get retconned later would still be around, but maybe then they shouldn't be doing stories that most people could recognize right out of the gate. This is a terrible idea, don't do it. Anyway, Spidey is swinging around, trying to deal with what his dad told him. He can't blame him for having such a negative outlook given what he went through. But what if it's not so distorted? What if he's right about human nature? Let's face it, Carnage and Shriek are a pretty strong argument in his favor. Hmm, are they though? See, the funny thing about human history is that time and again, what we repeatedly see in times of struggle and hardship is that most people will actually try to act decently and help others. There are major exceptions, of course, and it's easy to see the rich and powerful acting like jackasses time and again, but a recurring motif of those kinds of people are that they were already jerks throughout their lives. They didn't get told no enough, they didn't face hardships, and therefore couldn't imagine other people dealing with hardships, or they were ruthless enough so that it didn't matter how many they had to step on to get where they are, taking advantage of people's kindness or trust to enrich themselves at their expense. But that just means that most people are decent and trusting, 
something because some will take advantage of their generosity and it can be difficult to spot those exceptions because of people's inherently good natures. Now it's easy to fall into a belief that people generally aren't as good when we see very loud repeated examples of people being assholes like say during a pandemic but I wonder how many of them aren't also a case of being fed a certain belief system that emphasizes screw you got mine or equates caring about others as taking away your freedom because they trusted the words and opinions of people who don't care about others already. And it's easy to take a pessimistic view of humanity in turn when media tends to emphasize stories of people being jackasses over stories of people helping others. Which of course happens just as frequently, if not more so, than the jerky ones. Or as one of America's leading philosophers, Garfield Arbuckle, once put it, you are not immune to propaganda. And hey, Peter's an eternal optimist too. After weathering so many hard times and faced his own share of devils, he can't believe the average people that he's dedicated his life to saving could be as monstrous as that. So anyway, then he spots a massive crowd of people rioting and trying to kill each other and laughing in glee as they try to murder one another. But yeah, I guess here the frickin' purge started up, and Spidey has to step in to try to help someone being beaten to death. The guy tells Spider-Man that the city has gone crazy. Ever since Carnage was let loose, it seems like every lunatic in the city decided to cut loose and start their own sprees. Spidey tries to call out to people to tell them to stop this madness, but they just pile on him and attack in force until finally he knocks everyone away in one massive burst and leads us to the final splash page of the issue. Okay! You wanna act like devils? Then I'll treat you like devils! I'm tired of always holding back, being cautious, trying so hard to draw a moral line that no one even sees anymore! From here on in, I'll do whatever it takes to keep this city from going down in flames! Oh boy, uh, Peter? Um, you probably shouldn't look behind you then. From this moment on, you'll get no mercy from Spider-Man! And oh god, I really should not have gone into this pose! My ribs are basically powder at this point! But now we enter into part six, revealing the next hero to join in on the good guy's side. Yes, you're seeing it right! Michael Morbius! My friends, it's Morbin time! My show is where memes go to die. People are gonna be so confused watching this in a few years. Morbius during this time had become more of an anti-hero than a villain like he had started as, which we see here with him attacking some muggers, so his inclusion does make some sense, especially as he's the one that Venom and the others have come to recruit for their cause. While that goes down, Spidey is resetting his bandages and risking permanent damage to his body by not healing properly. As he swings off, he thinks that MJ might be the only one who could have convinced him to not make his darker turn, but he hasn't been able to find her since their last argument. A situation that's a bit more head tilting thanks to the sliding timescale of comics, since if this doesn't take place in the 90s in character history anymore, wouldn't they have cell phones? But no, MJ has decided that now is the time to dance! Yes, while New York is burning and her husband is risking his life, she's dancing the night away at a celebrity nightclub called The Deep. Unfortunately, Carnage and his crew decided to rent a limo to show up outside of its entrance, as the villains all swarm out of it to begin another rampage. While Spidey helps some civilians hurt in all the ruckus, Team Venom has picked up Carnage's trail thanks to Morbius' tracking abilities. MJ is injured in all this and almost another of Carnage's victims, but Venom saves her and very grossly licks her face, lest we forget that he's not really a good guy either despite his protests. Camera crew spotting all this allows Spidey to see what's going on and he heads there there too. He joins the fray as more and more fighting occurs, but this time they're actually doing a pretty good job of beating down the villains now that the heroes have numbers on their side. And this time they really do go on the run, barely escaping thanks to Demo Goblin setting up a wall of fire to block the heroes. And despite Peter's earlier rant about needing to be as merciless as his enemies, he says the four owe him for coming to their aid here and convinces them to help rescue all the trapped bystanders before they continue their pursuit. Cloak finds a woman putting on a brave face for someone with her. This poor girl's trying to be so brave, just like my beautiful Tandy when Shriek. This was surely the better way to honor Dagger's memory than cold revenge. For now. Later on, the cold revenge will be the best way to honor her memory. 
Spidey can't look at Mary Jane as he declares that he's with Venom all the way on this, ending part six with him following along with the group. Part seven sees the team having gathered at the abandoned orphanage where Carnage grew up, Spidey hoping that the location might give them some inspiration on what to do now. And apparently Cletus was a big green jelly fan given what's written on the wall. Also, I guess the place was really chilly because they set up a campfire in the middle of the floor. Anyway, they point out that normal people seem to be forming a kind of mob mentality in the wake of Carnage's violence, and they figure the only way to stop it is to put down Carnage directly. As such, they decide to focus on Carnage's vulnerabilities. Venom suggests getting Reed Richards' sonic gun, Black Cat even pointing out that they can recruit the Human Torch while they're at it, but Spidey says that the Fantastic Four and Avengers are out of town, hence why they haven't gotten involved in this mess yet. Still, the superheroine Firestar has flame powers too, so she might do in a pinch. Plus, she was one of Spider-Man's amazing friends, and that's gotta count for something. Cloak teleports out to find her, but Spidey finds it weird that he's able to do so at all, since Cloak's powers apparently need a dagger around for them to work. Still, despite the Fantastic Four being gone, they might still be able to grab the sonic gun, so Spidey, Black Cat, and Venom head off to retrieve it. Spider-Man also thinks to himself that a wedge is forming between him and MJ over all this, but Peter says he has to prioritize stopping Carnage. The threat is too big to do anything else. Morbius, meanwhile, is sent to the Ravencroft Institute to bust in and get information on Shriek, since she the one they know the least about. This goes nowhere. Speaking of our villains, they've decided to take a break from random murder to focus on destruction, heading to the Metropolitan Museum to smash up everything. The police come in. The NYPD formed the extreme emergency team specifically to handle crud like you. I'm sorry, I think you mean the extreme emergency team. However, the lead cop is killed by Carrion, who can decay people with a single touch. He doesn't speak here, but Carnage figures he's joining the team anyway. Something I like about Carnage's group as villains is that they all look distinct and horrifying in their own ways, despite having a very similar color scheme. Carnage's monstrous visage and oily symbiote texture, Shriek's punk rock look, Doppelganger's bestial Spider-Man-like appearance, Demo Goblin's demonic, yet still goblin-esque look, and finally Carrion, who's more like a decaying, sickly ghost, especially in how he moves when he's floating around. It's like a team of horror monsters, and it works really well. After a quick check with Mary Jane, who's angry that Peter still has not returned after all this, and naturally is still a bit shell-shocked after what happened at the club, we get an interlude with Deathlock. This is actually the third Deathlock, and he's traveling through cyberspace because of the 90s. Dude, I can't wait for us to be able to jack directly into the World Wide Web! We'll be literally cruising down the information superhighway! The narration seems to imply that he's not literally inside the digital world or something. This is just him processing the information he's receiving about all the violence caused by the Carnage crew. And he decides he needs to take action. Also, Deathlock's theme in the video game is just a ripoff of the Terminator theme, and I'm kind of down for that actually, but why wasn't it Robocop? If they ever did a remake of the Maximum Carnage beat-em-up, I'd love it if they could play as multiple different characters from the start. Instead, you can only play as Spider-Man or Venom during some sections. Back to our heroes, the three get closer to Four Freedoms Plaza, still being reconstructed after the events of Infinity War, and Spider-Man has to stop himself from ignoring a carjacking, because he can't pick and choose who deserves to be saved. But even the people he's trying to help try to attack him. While the other two berate him for getting involved, he does consider that there's got to be more than just mere mob mentality that's making people get so irrational like this. Meanwhile, Richard Parker is walking Aunt May home as she had insisted on depositing her social security check. She tries to talk to him about what he said to Peter, but then a guy comes out of an alley to attack them. The guy on TV! That carnage fella! He's right, you know! We should be stealing limos and crashing celebrity nightclubs! I worked in a tiny cubicle eight hours a day for 12 years, and all it got me was eye strain and a layoff notice. Maybe it is time for chaos. This is the darker ending to office space we were never meant to see. He punches Richard and tries to steal May's purse, but Richard grabs a stick and whacks the guy across the head. There's your good people, May. Feel like giving him another chance? Sure. After I take a few whacks with the stick first, of course. And the violence resumes as the villains start massacring people again. And yeah, once again, we maybe didn't need to see all this. Hell, there's a dead kid under Carnage in this one shot. Sure, this isn't super graphic or anything like some modern comics would do it, but it's still a bit of a yikes here or there. Deathlock arrives and starts shooting at them. 
Being a cyborg, he's immune to Carrion's death touch and manages to get a few good hits in, but ends up blasted by Shriek into a neon sign that fries his systems. At Four Freedoms Plaza, we see the after effects of that level in the game where they fight off all the security droids and grab the sonic rifle, Venom taking it to protect himself. Nearby, however, we see that the computers are sending information on the break-in to somebody. Regrouping in the orphanage, Cloak returns with Firestar. Spidey declares that now with Firestar and the sonic gun, they've got a real chance to take Carnage down. All Cassidy's gang have going for them is savagery and bloodlust, the emotions of primitive man. But with this sonic gun, we've got science on our side. And only a science major can kick this much ass. But as we can see in these last few panels of part seven, science ain't doing Deathlock a lot of good right now. Our heroes go to J. Jonah Jameson to use Carnage's trick right back at him. Have Jameson print something in the newspaper to lure Carnage to his old orphanage for a trap. Jameson is often inconsistently written when it comes to other superheroes. Sometimes he's written as a champion of mutant rights. Sometimes he's okay with other superheroes besides Spider-Man. But other times like this, he calls Cloak and Firestar just common vigilantes and despises them too. Anyway, with a threat from Venom, he agrees, though Firestar, not having gone through all that Spidey has, thinks they shouldn't have to lower themselves to the villain's tactics to do this. But yeah, the bugle is printed and this random guy is reading it at a bus stop until Carnage kills him to grab it. Finish with that paper yet? Oh my god, new petitions against tax? This is why my murder spree is justified! May, Richard, and Mary Parker head over to MJ and Peter's place to see them since they haven't been able to get a hold of them on the phone. They're confronted outside by a gang, but fortunately Flash Thompson and Liz's brother, reformed supervillain Molten Man, are also there and quickly deal with the gang before they can hurt the three. The message on the paper, Carnage Come Home, inspires the villain to bring his crew to the abandoned orphanage, try to explain his upbringing to go into why he is the way he is. And thus we get his full backstory. He murdered his dad for murdering his mother, who was apparently planning on killing him. Yeah, even he admits he might be remembering that all wrong. He was sent to the orphanage where he was bullied by other kids. The owner of the orphanage sadistically tortured kids, himself included, and he began having mental lapses. He began to use those to adjust himself and he grew insane. However, that's when the heroes spring their trap, though Carnage doesn't seem surprised to see them. While that's going on, a city worker is trying to free Deathlock from the neon sign. Apparently some sort of feedback loop is keeping them from just shutting off the power to free him. Fortunately, this is is a superhero comic, so we have a far more effective method of dealing with technology like this. Punching it. Yes, the immortal Iron Fist punches through the sign and frees him. This fallen hero's plight appeared to require the skills of Iron Fist, my friend. And man-made power is ever inferior to the power that makes a man. That's true. Why do you think I'm still doing the I am a man punch after all these years? The fight against the Carnage crew goes well. The sonic gun sadly doesn't seem to have much effect on him, but Firestar's microwave beams are enough to completely dissipate his costume. Venom prepares to kill Cassidy, but Spider-Man stops him. Shriek, angry that Cletus is showing weaknesses, scratches his face, and we learn that his blood is completely mutated. As soon as said blood is exposed to air, the symbiote is able to immediately reform, ending part eight. The villains counterattack, and the more bloodthirsty members of our heroes go into the fray, much to Firestar's frustration. Also, her jacket has magically teleported back onto her after being absent last issue. A shame that it was missing before, because the jacket actually really works with her costume. But yeah, Firestar is mad because even Spidey is thinking about going along with the anti-heroes, that the ends might actually justify the means. Black Cat, in turn, says that so many have been slaughtered already that they need to stop wringing their hands and help the people actually trying to stop the villains. I know it might seem repetitive that this argument keeps coming up, but that's the main point of the story. The villains keep escalating the threat, and every time they seem to score a victory, they just hit another setback. So should they just accept that the villains need to be put down? And it's not necessarily something that can just be settled easily. Even Spider-Man's little rant a few issues ago was done in the heat of the moment, and enough time has passed that he's having second thoughts again. It's not always so easy to make the call, especially when things keep piling on for our heroes. The aura of evil, of insanity in the air, is so thick that Spider-Man can feel it. It's settled over him, like a layer of soot. Poor guy is in so much pain from his ribs that he doesn't even recognize high humidity anymore. He feels poisoned by it, corrupted. Yet deep in his heart is a belief, almost a prayer, that there has to be another way. A better way than this. Wait, I've got it! Anti-Carnage Bake Sale!
And he feels that, if only he could stop, catch his breath, see clearly for a moment, the way would make itself known. Anti-carnage bake sale? No, no, that was stupid. Wait, I've got it! Sexy car wash! After a one-page interlude with Mary Jane to remind us, yep, she's angry and worried about Peter, this is the kind of thing that got creators hating the marriage. They tended to just make her fret instead of having some sort of expansion on the core ideas of the story, or just not have her in it at all. But that's not the marriage's fault, it's just lazy writing. Cloak fails to freak Shriek out with his dark cloak dimension powers, as she tells him it's nothing she hasn't seen before. In fact, she explains that she didn't just develop sound powers from all that, but she became a kind of psychic channel, transmitting her own murderous thoughts out to normal people. And indeed, that's your explanation for the wave of violence. No one's been inspired by Carnage's mayhem. It's a low-key form of mind control. Spidey wonders if this is extending to the rest of them, though that idea doesn't go anywhere. And good that it doesn't. While I'm okay with her being the one behind the normal citizens going wild, the debate between the heroes should be of their own choosing. And it's a legitimate debate to have. People are still talking about it over in the comments of my Man of Steel video. And yes, you can search those comments for my replies to people bringing up Superman 2 and how I feel about the killings and that. It's a point that still hasn't been settled for people in the almost three decades since this story came out. Unfortunately, that debate is also the beginning of the undoing of our heroes. Morbius tries to attack one of the crazed civilians to drink his blood, but Black Cat stops him, and in turn is attacked by another, and the distraction leads Morbius to get hit by one of Demo Goblin's pumpkin bombs. Carnage is forced back by Firestar's heat rays, but she worries that he'll just reform his symbiote at a certain point. Venom insists, then, that they can't stop until Cletus is dead. Spidey and Firestar try to argue back, but Venom points out that the blood of innocence keeps being spilled all around them. Desperate, the two finally agree. Firestar in particular is mostly doing it for Spidey's sake. If he's finally at the point where he's ready to take a life, then maybe she's been fooling herself. She pours the heat on, but over the course of a page, we see the two heroes change their minds until Spider-Man screams at her to stop. It's a good page, though I think it might have been better to see Carnage's suffering beyond just the after effects of him pleading not to die. It's one thing to think you're ready to kill, but quite another to actually see someone suffering and in pain from that. Venom, pissed, attacks Firestar instead of trying to go over to finish Carnage himself. No wonder he's always trying to eat brains. He needs some for himself. Spidey intervenes, and the two struggle for a moment before Venom backhands him far away. Carnage is recovering, and Venom tries to advance on them to finally end him, but Shriek's sonic blasts are able to exhaust his symbiont enough for the two to counterattack. With him beaten down, Carnage decides to take his defeated foe and torture him a bit, grabbing the sonic gun for good measure too. Part 9 ends with Spidey beaten down. The other heroes are equally down for the count, and the narration echoes how the issue started. The air of evil hanging over everything. And how Spidey just feels like he needs a chance to catch his breath, recover, and find a better way than this. And thankfully, that better way comes with someone offering him a hand. The star-spangled man with a plan. Also, nice touch with the artwork having his head in front of the moon to give him an angelic halo. It's probably the best moment in the entire story. Sure, one could probably argue that Cap entering in for what should be Spider-Man story takes something away from him. However, after nine issues of growing darkness and moral compromise and the characters getting ready to do something they'd regret for the rest of their lives, it's a moment of hope. The Gandalf the White, I come back to you now at the turn of the tide kind of scene that reminds us that heroes can be good and decent and honest and inspiring. Sure, modern portrayals of heroes have made Cap more willing to kill, but this was still during a time when the character would not deliberately take a life either, and that's what makes it important. I've said it before, I prefer my heroes not to kill, but with certain characters I'm more willing to accept that's just more in line with who they are. Marvel characters tend to fit that mold more than DC ones, for instance, though Spidey should still never cross that line. In any case, while the villains carry Eddie Brock off, they resume their rampage. Captain America, Firestar, and Spidey have retreated to Avengers HQ to monitor things. Cap was the one who got the signal about the break-in at Four Freedoms Plaza, and unfortunately the only one who could come. 
Cloak, Black Cat, and Morbius are continuing on the trail of the villains while these three try to think of a plan. However, it seems they're not the only ones monitoring things. Deathlock has recovered, and he, along with Iron Fist, tapped into the Avengers hardware to try to learn what they could about the Carnage crew for their next encounter. Everyone plans on meeting up soon. Spidey intends to head home before then to try to check in with MJ. Avengers equipment patched up my rib cage. What's left of it anyway? Team Venom lose the trail at the edge of the water leading to the Statue of Liberty, and are ambushed by Doppelganger, Carrion, and Demo Goblin. At the statue, Carnage and Shriek have strung up Venom in some chains above a roaring campfire to torture him. At Spidey's place, power has gone out with the ongoing riots, and Mary Jane is waiting alone at her place while everyone else gathers with Liz Osborne. Peter meets up with MJ, finally embracing her. She's still mad at him, though. She can't continue to condone his behavior, but then the radio starts announcing a hostage situation going on in their local police precinct. The fight with the villains, meanwhile, is a bit more intense than the previous one. Black Cat getting severely beat down by the three in one moment. Until she's rescued by the final new hero added to this whole thing, and frankly the least necessary... Nightwatch. Nightwatch was a relatively new character at the time, and had a costume very derivative of Spawn. But his story was based on science instead of mystical stuff. It's an interesting concept at the very least. Dr. Kevin Trench saw someone wearing the Night Watch costume be killed fighting some terrorists, only to unmask the guy and reveal that it was a future version of himself. The character didn't really amount to much, and the story was resolved in his solo series, until in 2015 it was revealed in the pages of She-Hulk that all of that was a lie, part of a mystical spell by Nightwatch, aka Night Eater, to alter reality and make everyone think he had been a hero the whole time. So yay, that's two episodes in a row now that can bring up pointlessly making heroes into villains. But yeah, forgetting all that for a second, this should have been cut. Nightwatch comes in this late in the game, and I honestly forgot he was even in the story. Hell, he didn't even get a power-up cameo in the game like everyone else did. But whatever, he comes in to help while Spidey deals with the hostage situation and another bit of padding to this story. After forcing the villains to retreat back to the statue, Black Cat decides that she needs to go back home and lick her wounds, while Cloak ponders why everything around him keeps reminding him of Dagger. Well, gee, Cloak, could it possibly be because she died, like, two days ago? Spidey rejoins the more heroic team to end Part 10, which... Yeah, part 10 is definitely the most unnecessary of this story so far. Sure, there are a few important bits in it, but the inclusion of Nightwatch out of nowhere, who barely contributes anything else, the brief subplot with the police station hostage situation, and the reunion with Mary Jane not going anywhere, too much of it feels like a waste of time. Speaking of Nightwatch, he and Morbius attack the Carnage crew while the rest of our heroes spot the source of the increasing madness in the streets. Shriek, now using her powers to really get the civilians riled up. Mary Jane rejoins the rest of the family in Liz Osborne's place while our heroes take on Shriek. Firestar proclaims that she'll incapacitate her. Ew, big words. I'm impressed. Not. Outdated slang won't keep us all at bay, Shriek. Was not outdated by 1993? Cap manages to finally knock her down with his mighty shield, as those who oppose his shield must yield, while Morbius and Nightwatch are forced to retreat from the statue when things start turning against them. Carnage encourages the others to join Shriek in her mayhem while he continues torturing Venom. With Shriek down for the moment, the heroes take their time to shake people out of the violence she instilled in them. With some, it's as easy as Cap glowering at them. Some, like Iron Fist, need to get someone wearing a karate gi to not use their martial arts like this. And then there's Deathlock, getting a guy to not loot computers. Computers make life better, son. Stealing them doesn't. Now then, let me tell you about Bitcoin. Spidey even stops a woman who is going to throw her children off of a rooftop, and it's his unique presence that stops her because one of those kids is a fan of his. Being true to what I am is the most important thing. I realize that now. And if I ignore it, everything else in my life, including my relationship with Mary Jane, will be nothing more than a hollow sham. It's a good thing I'll never abandon my principles and make a deal with Satan or anything. Doppelganger and Demo Goblin free Shriek and battle erupts again. Felicia Hardy observes the events from afar, wondering if she should give up being the Black Cat in the wake of all this, given how much physical hurt she's already taken. 
Cloak, meanwhile, returns to the church where Dagger died and finds himself drawn there, trying to figure out a way to permanently stop Carnage and company. But fortunately, things are going well back to the battle. The civilians, freed from Shriek's control, all know what she did to them, and thus the massive mob now surrounds them and prepares to fight the villains too. From Liz's apartment, they're watching things go down on a small portable TV, exuberant that the heroes have turned things around. Even Mary Jane has realized that she was wrong. Win or lose, trying to fight was worth it. But unfortunately, Shriek decides to be a party pooper and cranks up the psychic attack. Unable to sway the heroes, but the mob are once again turned towards the good guys to end part 11. As the news recaps the recent events for anyone coming into the story, at part 12 of 14, Richard Parker turns off the TV to rant and rave about the situation. When we were locked away in that Soviet hellhole, one of the few things that gave me hope, kept me sane, was thinking about my life back home. A world that made some kind of sense. Moral. Orderly. But I now see what a fool I was. I mean, for God's sakes, the last issue was a small portable TV because the power was out, but now it's a regular sized TV and everything's well lit as if there was no power outage at all. He rambles that evil was always festering beneath the surface and it's finally burst through, and Mary Jane finally tells him to shut the hell up. There are decent people out there putting their lives on the line. They need our good thoughts, our prayers, not your negativity and cynicism. True, but I have to be a bit negative about the art. What the hell is happening to your body in this panel, Mary Jane? Looks like your torso has been smushed by the word balloon. But yeah, she rightfully points out that they were able to make a difference just by being there. It was only Shriek's interference that caused the mob to go wild again. So as Aunt May smiles and sips tea, MJ tells Richard to keep his mouth shut already. Back at the Statue of Liberty, Venom seems to plead for his life as Carnage proclaims he's going to keep torturing him for days and weeks. But when he tries to use the sonic cannon on him again, uh... Well, it's not entirely clear what's going on. He says he managed to put a piece of the symbiote into the gun when he pretended to beg for his life, but then why is it sending out that much symbiote goop at him? Still, he recovers enough strength to free himself, punch Carnage, and then flee, admitting to himself that the torture was affecting him and he needs to go and recover. Carnage, however, is pissed and broken over this, screaming like an angry child that he was winning. But Carnage, that's just more chaos for you. Unless you're just full of it or something. While Cloak rants in the empty church about not knowing what it is he's feeling while in there, Captain America is trying to lead the heroes through the civilians and get to Shriek. But of course, it's hard to do so when dozens of people are trying to attack you. Shriek rambles to the other members of the crew that she's bitterly resentful of heroes like them, that she endured torment and abuse at the hands of people she loved and trusted, but for all their protestations of being the good guys, she never got to be rescued. It's Iron Fist who finally has a breakthrough, using a meditative technique to reach down into the calmness of his own soul. It can spread outwards, and it does have an effect on some of the crowd, but not enough, especially when he was surrounded. He explains this to Spidey after he swings in to rescue him. We are all essentially one, divine. All souls crave the experience of that oneness. Offered, it can't be refused. Unless there's, like, a lot of you, then it can be refused. Spidey thinks that if the rest of them could learn to do what he did, they'd be able to calm the crowd more easily. How long would it take? Eight or ten years. Plus a lot of student loans. And Spidey punches a chimney. Great, my ribs are healed, but now I've broken my hand! Spidey thinks it's all so hopeless, remembering the words of his father about how inside people are just full of evil, but then he recalls what Aunt May told him, that our hearts tell us what's right and that people sometimes just stop listening. And that gives him an idea. And back at the church, a bright light shoots out from inside of Cloak. Shriek decides it's time to go on the rampage again, but then Carnage shows up. Since he was already pissed off about what happened to Venom, it's clear he's looking for an excuse to be an asshole, so he attacks her for going out murdering people without permission. Ah yes, the ultimate freedom that Carnage believes in. As long as he's the one who gets to dictate it. The other members of the crew turn on him, Carnage even killing Doppelganger, not that the others seem to really care, and Demo Goblin in particular ready to just finally leave, but it seems thanks to Carnage's little attack, the heroes were able to get the crowd under control and got them away from the area. So the heroes can now face down the villains. More, as the villains reunite to fight them, Cloak returns, 
with a very much alive dagger to end part 12. Naturally, everyone is confused by this, but she explains what happened. It seems that Shriek's attack somehow caused her light-based powers to feed back on herself, literally transforming her into light. Her form was scattered, but contained inside of Cloak. Thankfully, her connection with him allowed her to finally reconstitute inside the church. Shriek is not taking this well, screaming that nothing can help or save you inside of the darkness of the cloak, especially not love. I do enjoy that what finally got this serial killer's mind to break was that someone she thought she killed came back to life. Just imagine what would have happened if she had killed, like, Captain America and he was back in six months like any other supposedly dead person in the Marvel Universe. Shriek attacks Dagger, both sides wanting to help their own member, but they're held back by Carnage and Cloak, respectively. In order for her to get beyond the trauma of her death, Dagger must face her killer alone. You think that's a regular form of therapy for heroes who come back to life? Screw medication and counseling, you just have to punch the one who killed you? Dagger uses her light powers on a more psychic level, trying to help Shriek's psychoses and neuroses caused by the trauma in her life. Shriek seems to be coming around to it as Dagger says she has to want help, but then she gets pissed again and attacks. Spidey saves her, and despite Dagger thinking she's failed, he actually believes that she showed them how to win. Carnage goes over to Shriek, who says she wasn't fooled by what Dagger was trying to do, that she's been lied to too many times by people claiming to be good guys. And now, in contrast to the page where Spidey he ranted to the sky that he'd be without mercy, we now have him standing alone against Carnage and his crew. The others might have decided that you were too much to handle, but Spider-Man's no quitter. I'm the only one dumb enough to fight you on my own. They fight, Spidey getting in a few good shots, but ultimately he gets knocked down. It's honestly surprising that it took this long for his costume to be damaged in all this. He still tries to stand up, saying that they all saw what happened. The decency in Dagger's heart was more than what Shriek could handle. Carnage decides to show Spidey their point of view, instructing Shriek to send a full blast of that same kind of psychic energy at him. Shame, self-disgust, anger, pain, etc. This darkness is nothing new to him. Gotta love it when the comics acknowledge that Peter his life is just endless misery. Still, that just means he's able to fight back against it because he's dealt with it before. The redemptive power of the one emotion Cletus Cassidy finds it impossible to understand. Love. The carnages of the world mock the very concept. They call love a delusion, a lie, a sign of weakness. In reality, a sign of no parking. Shriek gets blasted, and we soon learn what the other heroes have been doing while Spidey distracted the villains. They've been building a little device for Deathlock to wear. The scientists at the nearby Rand Corporation laboratory where it was hastily created dubbed it an Alpha Magna Illuminator. But its purpose is far simpler than the name implies. Spider-Man, who conceived the idea and dispatched the others to see its completion, called it, only half-jokingly, a good bomb. Well, that name is just ridiculous. How is this a bomb when it shoots an energy beam? It's a good vibes cannon. Basically, it's the counterbalance of Shriek's own psychic powers. Instead of projecting out the worst aspects of humanity, it's going for the parts that inspire calm, hope, peace, the same kind of psychic energies that Dagger was using to soothe Shriek. Don't you just love a gun that shoots ASMR? Spider-Man saw the solution that his allies enact even now. Push back. Not with the shadows of the heart, but with all that's best, that's highest in the human spirit. Push back with the same power Iron Fist tapped into when he stilled the violent mob. That dagger released when she soothed the soul of her murderer. Push back with a sophisticated biofeedback device that amplifies the brain's calming alpha waves, overriding Shriek's tide of inner darkness. Now, some people have a real problem with the solution, that it's just too ridiculous. A gun that shoots feel-good rays, and after all this story, it's just too silly. These people are wrong. I kid, I kid. Difference of opinion and all. I get why people can't accept this and find it just goofy. For me, this is the only way the story could possibly resolve satisfactorily. Throughout it, they've been dealing with violence, murder, aggression, negativity and evil from people who find the very concept of love a sick joke, to the point where they declare themselves a family centered around abuse and hurting people, mocking the very idea of people who care about each other. The heroes throughout the story have tried to meet them head on, 
fight fire with fire, or even just use traditional superhero tactics of punching them and tying them up. But these are villains utterly ruthless and relentless. When you're dealing with a relentless, implacable enemy, you can't necessarily fight them on their own terms. They've tried fighting violence with more violence every step of the way, and it's gotten them nowhere. Sure, the writers could have just had Spider-Man punch each of them out and let that be the end of it, but what would that have proven? What would that have said in the philosophical theme of the story? About human decency, of engaging the enemy with the same lack of ethics that they possess? It'd just be Superman at Earth's end, a gun-toting Superman saying that guns are evil while resolving the situation by using guns. But instead, they use the villain's evil plan and turned it back on them. If she could inspire evil in people, then they can inspire good. Now, that being said, there are still some issues with it. First, I think it would have been better to set up Dagger's calming light earlier, like against the street punks when they rescue Spider-Man, because otherwise this power kind of comes out of nowhere. Secondly, man, they whipped this thing up in a hurry. Even for the super science of the Marvel Universe, this was like 10 minutes tops to rig this thing up while Spidey was fighting the villains. At least when they did Mood Slime and Ghostbusters 2, they'd been studying the stuff the whole movie and learning how to use it and then making everybody happy and dripping with goo. How do you feel? Groovy. Thirdly, if the Marvel Universe has a gun that makes people pacified and happy and, as we see here, can cure the carrion virus through the power of love, why don't they ever employ this thing again? Hey, Thanos, stop hunting after the Cosmic Cube and vibe with us, man. But anyway, Demo Goblin tries to run away, but Spidey manages to pull him back down and knock him out from the power of the device. As you saw, Carrion was cured of the virus in him, and Shriek is just mellowing out. Hey, man. Let me tell you something. I love you. Carnage, however, is a different case. As the narration points out, pain is all he's ever really known. Kindness, decency, and the amount of abuse he suffered have made the emotions they're trying to instill in him completely alien. There's an explosion of energy from Carnage trying to counter the energy, and it seems he was killed. Spider-Man thinks that means they failed and they killed him, but Cap and Deathlock reassured him that's not the case. It was an accident, a result of Carnage resisting them so hard. Still, all's well that ends well, am I right? Wait, isn't this 14 parts? With the other villains recaptured, Spidey tries to process everything that happened. Venom showing up pissed that he got cheated out of killing Carnage. Still, he's too weak from the torture to really do anything. And then Carnage rises up out of a nearby pond to end part 13. How long was he waiting in there for this? The final part of Maximum Carnage is... fine. It's basically the coda of the story, bringing final resolution to everything, but this was probably not necessary. Aside from it being a bit extra length on top of an already long story, as I said, the resolution was better when it wasn't a big physical brawl, but we're going on even longer now to have one. It's not bad, it's not padding, it's just more when we didn't need more. Venom gets his second wind and engages Carnage, Spidey realizing that Carnage must have faked his death by putting a mock mask over one of his victims. Seems like a lot of thought for him to put in when everything was going to hell, but whatever. This is made even weirder when you consider his mind is kind of screwed up right now, still reeling from the effects of the hippie ray as he's re-experiencing all of his own trauma. Carnage flees as Venom is able to take him on. Spidey tries to get Venom to let him contact the others for help, but Venom just smashes Spidey's ribs on the other side now and runs off in pursuit. I... I'm busted up on... Both sides now! I don't think you've slept in days either, dude. At this point, I'm pretty sure you're immortal. As civilians start partying on the streets over Carnage's supposed death, the book remembers that Morbius and Nightwatch were in this story, and we can forget about them and move on. MJ meets Peter at the hospital, where he sadly informs her of Carnage still being out there. Carnage flees back to the cell where he originally got the symbiote, Venom chasing him down. He even saves a security guard because too many innocents have died already, but of course Carnage flees yet again. Peter and MJ return home, and Richard takes the opportunity to rant about them there devils again, saying that this sort of thing is never truly over that the monsters always manage to find a way to return, which upsets Liz Osborne since, you know, her husband is dead. And would definitely have a lot more impact if Harry Osborne didn't come back to life later. His dad too, for that matter. So yeah, Richard's right. They always manage to find a way to return. Still, Peter takes Richard to the roof to privately tell him that, 
No, he's wrong. The only reason they survived the prison was because of their hope. You're not alone, Dad. You never were. The world is full of men and women who have the courage to listen to their hearts and who believe in doing what's right. Unfortunately, they're all wearing terrible costumes, but still... Like, yeesh, why is it that Firestar managed to pull off the jacket over her costume look, but none of the Avengers do? But yeah, he says he can't surrender to despair, or he'll run the risk of becoming a monster too. After some minor foreshadowing for the reveal of the parents as androids thing, Peter goes to Mary Jane and destroys the film he took of Carnage in the Rampage, not wanting to profit from the devastation or helping to glorify him. Which... I can see his viewpoint on, but on the other hand, sometimes the photos of such things are powerful and can motivate people to make sure it doesn't happen again. Regardless of that, Peter suits up and tells MJ to not try to talk him out of going after Carnage. However, MJ has come around and says she's gonna love him no matter what, and will continue to try her damnedest to accept his part in all this. And as always, go to hell one more day! Carnage fled back to the orphanage, where the ghosts of his past are... I was gonna say metaphorically haunting him, but this is the Marvel Universe, so those might be actual, literal ghosts. Venom arrives and fight, fight, fight. Once more, he's about to kill Carnage, but Spidey arrives, somehow knowing where they are, and intervenes. Venom sees Carnage as his darker side, and that he's responsible for all the death he caused. Spidey says he knows exactly how Venom feels because he feels the same way about him. Venom is confused by this, but once again, Carnage is fled in the distraction. Felicia Hardy learns from MJ that Peter has gone out after Carnage and ponders whether she should rejoin the hunt too, since it could mean her own death given what happened before. Spidey and Venom track Carnage to a cemetery, where he's trying to dig up a corpse of who he claims is his mother. More fighting, and Spidey once more has to separate Venom from Carnage, pointing out that with all the abuse Cletus suffered, it's no wonder that he turned out the way he he did, that he never had a chance for anything else, and may be the most innocent of all. Eh, not really. A victim, yes, but I know tons of people who suffered mental and physical abuse throughout their lives, and they didn't become nihilistic serial killers, Pete! Even Carnage says that's bullcrap and tries to kill him, but he ends up getting thrown to Harry and Norman Osborn's graves. Spidey thinks that he should bury his own ghosts, assuming he gets the chance, because Carnage leaps at him to stab him. But fortunately, the Black Cat was able to arrive thanks to her plot senses and kick him out of the way. Venom tackles Carnage into a nearby high electric power generator that just happens to be next to the cemetery, and it explodes. Carnage, while not dead, is still heavily injured and unconscious, allowing him to find Finally be captured. Venom retreats to a nearby truck, thinking that maybe Spidey had a point in letting Cletus live, though for now his work is done. The Avengers are called in to take Cassidy into custody via a stasis chamber. Black Cat says that even with Carnage contained, she's worried because monsters have a way of returning. And so our comic ends with Spidey saying that, believe it or not, some monsters stay dead and buried forever, and their ghosts can't haunt you unless you allow them. He hopes. And in the end, hope is our best weapon against darkness. Doesn't work out in regards to the Osborns, but still. Maximum Carnage is overall great, as I hope I have demonstrated. It is not without flaws, of course. You could easily cut out a lot of Part 10, condense down the final part, cut Nightwatch entirely, maybe cut the nightclub attack, and basically trim this down to a much more acceptable 12-issue saga. And of course, the violence is pretty hard, and there's a heavy death toll on this one when it comes to civilian casualties. But in the end, hope does prevail. The problem with Maximum Carnage is that a lot of people took it at face value. That it's just 90s excess, with murder and mayhem and horror, with tons of characters crossing over and interacting for no good reason, and that it revels in its violence. That's not the idea at all. Maximum Carnage is a story about rejecting that. Because constantly throughout the story, everyone's trying to push Spider-Man into becoming one of those kinds of uber-violent vigilantes, that he has to kill and destroy and grit his teeth, but in the end, he refuses. It's a story about hope, of humanity's better angels prevailing against evil. It gets muddled a bit in a few spots, particularly with tacking on another issue when things resolve themselves pretty well in Part 13. You didn't need to have the fake dead Carnage, just have Carnage be unconscious. But ultimately, this is a story of how Spider-Man looked darker, more edgy and anti-hero tactics right in the face, and made them blink instead. I get why people don't like it, especially the resolution, but this is a superhero story. Shriek laughed at the Infinity War stuff as being too hokey for words, 
But this is a story of a man with spider powers teaming up with a woman dressed as a cat, a living vampire, a cyborg, a woman with fire powers, a guy dressed in American flag colors who was frozen in ice from World War II. Superheroes are hokey because they present a world sillier and more fun than our own. Solving problems in ridiculous, optimistic ways is great. Superheroes are a genre of optimism, dang it, that people are worth saving and helping, even if it means putting on a mask to do it. It's weird to think about the fact that this was a year before the Clone Saga started. The thing I always read about in regards to the lead up to it was how Spider-Man had gotten so dark. The character was being rejected by fans because of the paces they were putting him through, and the belief that maybe it was time to shake things up for the better. But like, here's Spidey in 1993 going through a very physically and emotionally draining storyline, yet coming out on top renewed and happy. I mean, sure, we had the robot parents reveal, Aunt May in the hospital, the machinations of Harry Osborn left behind after this. It's a lot, but I was under the impression that the darker turn for Spidey had been over the course of, like, two to three years before the Clone Saga began, not just a single year. Then again, when you're printing four or five Spider-Man books at the same time, I guess it's a few years worth of stuff all happening at once. Next time, we embrace the goofiness some more with another issue of DC Challenge. I don't mean to weird you out, but that coffin Carnage dug up, it's empty. Oh my god! Carnage's mom is a zombie! Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!